Good day, good people. My name is Brad King, and you are watching and listening to the Downtown Riders Jam video podcast, which is part of the Solid Listen Podcast Network. We're coming to you from deep inside the jam bunker today. The day we're recording it, it is quite lovely. After uh, snow the last few days, it's like 50 degrees. It's a lovely winter day. I may even get the fire pit going in the backyard. Thank you for spending a little time with us today. Uh, this is a, a fantastic conversation and a fantastic program with Bruce Letowitz, whose book, The Universe is on Our Side, Restoring Faith in American Public Life, which is out right now. So if you've listened and watched the program over the last few months, you know I've had social scientists and researchers on, people who study why people reject science, the sort of psychology behind all of that. And today's conversation is not about what happens when people don't do that. It is about how we begin to build a society in which things like religion and secularism can work together. Like how do we find ways to talk to each other and communicate? Because if you live in this world right now, particularly in America, you know, these are very difficult things. Everything has been so polarized and it's really hard to find your way through that. Although I think in individual moments, like, and you're going to hear me talk about my girlfriend and I, um, you know, we, we have these kinds of discussions in very civil ways and her family and my family have been very kind and open to me as we talk about things. I'm an atheist. The people I am surrounded by are not. And yet we all find ways to be respectful of each other and communicate and work towards sort of similar goals, even though maybe some of our beliefs are not the same. So talking to Bruce about this subject uh, and about his book is, I think, the perfect time to do this as the holiday season's upon us. So he's actually here in Pittsburgh, which may not mean anything to you, but it means something to me. He's a professor of law at Duquesne University. Um, he teaches in state and federal constitutional law and jurisprudence, specializing in law and religion and law in the secular uh, world. Uh, he's the direct co-director of the Duquesne University School of Law's Pennsylvania Constitutional website. And in 1981, he founded the Allegheny County Death Penalty Project, which he directed for 13 years. And he he's done a lot of work in the, the sort of against the death penalty. Uh, we talk a little bit about that. Um, he's a writer, columnist. He's written four books. Um, he has a biweekly column on public affairs for the Pennsylvania Capital Star. All of that is to say he is a fascinating guy. And we only talked for about 25 minutes, although we have decided that we are going to talk more outside of this because he's just such an interesting guy. And I think these issues, like I said, are some of the most important facing us right now. And if you've listened to the show, it's why I keep having people like this on the program. Before we get to Bruce, some business. You know what this is. This is the point. If you listen to the show that you skip so that you can get to when the interview begins. But for those of you new, hang out for just a minute. So the video podcast come out every Monday and Friday. The jam proper, our 60 minute show comes out on Wednesday. Two things you can do to help us grow the program. More importantly, to help authors find new audiences. Think of those people in your life who love books, who read, who are always got a book or magazine or something in front of them. Tell them about our show. Second thing you can do is you can either head over to Apple Podcasts if you have an iPhone or the Facebook page at The Writer's Jam and leave us a review. Uh, you can head over to our website, thewritersjam.com, where you can always see the video podcast. If you're looking for books to read, we have book reviews up. Got a bookshop link where you can buy books from local and independent bookstores from across the country. Sign up for our newsletter. And you can support everybody on the Solid Listen Podcast Network for just a dollar or five dollars a month. You get commercial free episodes and all kind of bonus content. Malls and Nicole are building stuff out. Uh, Chevy Stevens and I, Chevy Stevens, who I've had on the program, who's a thriller author, bestseller. Uh, we're launching a Patreon show next year, early next year. So I look forward to talking to you about that. So now's the time to go get signed up. I know the holiday season is busy for everybody. I know you're running around. There's presents and family stuff and cooking and cleaning and wrapping and all of the things that go on this whole month. No matter what you celebrate or how you celebrate, there's some shit going on. So I appreciate you stopping by the bunker to spend just a couple minutes with me. I hope that your day is going well and you're taking care of yourself and each other. I hope that this season brings you love and happiness and joy and all the things that you deserve. I also hope that you'll go get the shot, go get the booster. Uh, Omicron is coming. Let's knock this thing out. Get back to life as we know it. For now, 
I hope that you will sit back and enjoy the next 30 minutes or so as I have a conversation with Bruce Levitz. Well, what happened to me was around the, the year 2000, that period, um, I, I, I was losing my faith in God and religion had been very important to me. I'd been raised in Orthodox Judaism and um, I was very active in Dor Hadash congregation, uh, one of the three that were attacked in 2018 by a gunman. Um, and so religion was very important to me, but I was, I was losing, gradually losing my, my belief in the God of the Bible. And at the same time that was happening to me, that was happening to the culture. Um, it, it was sort of um, replicated in the culture and all the, the rise of the nuns, the non-affiliated people, uh, many of whom say they believe in God, but when you press them, it's not really true. They have no real conception of God at all. So, um, so one thing that, that brought me into this realm is to try to find meaning without God. And um, uh, because I was raised in religion, I know that's much more difficult to do than uh, the new atheists, for example, thought it was. They thought God was no big deal, but I knew that wasn't true. Um, at the same time, I, I noticed another trend, a horrible trend, and that is that I began to experience in conversations with friends, colleagues, family members. At a certain point, they would always get say, but that's just your opinion, <laughs> as if, as, as, as if, you know, fundamental right and wrong wasn't real. Yeah, uh, it couldn't be real. It could just be a matter of opinion. And I began to look around, and I found that this was true all through the culture, including in law. And as you said earlier, it had nothing to do with politics. So I, I wrote this law review article, the uh, the uh, five days in May that values died in American law. And I looked at two 1992 opinions, one joined by everybody on the left on the on the U.S. Supreme Court, the other everybody on the right. And they both affirmed that, that um, values were nothing but human constructs. So it was unanimous on the US Supreme Court. I couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, particularly during that, that time. I mean, obviously. Well, I mean, that's well, a, but... That is a really serious change in a culture that had been based on a theistic view of the universe. I'm not saying it was a Christian culture exactly. I'm not saying the framers created a Christian nation, but all of the framers of the constitution came out of uh, a theistic uh, understanding of the universe, um, if you will, Dr. King, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. They all thought that. Yeah. And if we no longer think that that's a big change. There's so many things I want to unpack because I am, I am part of that new atheist movement, but my girlfriend uh, is a Christian and there have been people have sort of talked like, how do you do that? And I'm like, well, because we have a great respect for each other. Like we, like, I don't like I know what works for me and I know what works for her. And I always tell folks, if you can find a way to have peace in this universe, whatever it takes for you to do that, you got friends in addiction recovery and things like that. That's the thing you should do. And, and nobody should tell you that that's a bad thing. Right. And you should support somebody being able to do that. As you know, that's not a common discussion that we have in the culture anymore. No, and, and it isn't exactly clear why, because the truth is that nihilism and relativism could easily lead to exactly that kind of, of uh, compassion and generosity. Yeah. Uh, and so I have in my book, you know, the book, the book asks the question, is the universe on our side? I answer yes. But <laughs> in the title. <laughs> many, many people, most people who are secular answer no. And I, and I have a whole chapter about how great, how a very flourishing civilization could be built on the no, that is no, the universe is not on our side. It's just a collection of forces and matter. We're all alone. We're an accident of evolution. Our, 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 our metaphysical longings are meaningless. That, that could lead to compassion. Yeah. Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan thought it would. Yeah, so I think it does. Up. Yeah. I mean, um, I always tell people the fact that you're here, I mean, and this is a thing that Dawkins and people have said, the fact that you're here now is a miracle. And to treat it as anything other than that, and to and to view the moments that you have as special, like the fact that like I don't believe that there's an afterlife doesn't make me want to go be a jackass. It makes right. me want to be a better person because this is what we have. Like so that's the, it's it's amazing to me that the that reason. So the reason I think that has not happened yet um, is because I, I don't think we've recognized why we're at the point we're at. 
In other words, if, 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 if all the secular people like you and me could say, the reason that we're in a mess and we hate each other is that we used to believe in God as a culture, and now we've lost that underpinning and foundation, then it would be, it would be possible to rediscover a foundation in which we could be fair and loving to each other. But at the moment, you know, we're still in this, you know, I'm against religion stuff and yeah. God is, is stupid and, you know, all that, all that, you know, it's the last war. Secularists should, should say, oh, we won. Yeah. You know, the, God's dead. So now what? Now you have the positive task of building a secular civilization. And it's very difficult to do. Yeah, I, it's, this is sort of a tangent, but I just interviewed Giannis Barakapis, who was the Greek treasury minister during the financial crisis, right? And, and his, he wrote this book because he had been talking about anti-capital. Like, we, well, how do you build a, a society that isn't capitalistic? Mm -hmm. And his wife finally said, well, you just said what's bad with capitalism. Now you need to, like, what would it look like? And he was like, I actually had a really hard time with that. It's easy to argue against. It's hard then to build a thing. And so that's he right. wrote this book thinking about how would you build it? And I feel a little bit like that's where the secular people are, right? Where, which I think is what you're saying, which is that yep. they're like, well, this is not real. In my opinion, this is not real. And then somebody's like, well, what, well how does charity work? And we're like, mm, well. Uh, that's right. We just say you could be good without God. Yeah. <laughs> but that's never the problem. The yeah. problem is to be good without good. Right. And, you know, I grew up in the church, uh, the holiday season, the church gets together, takes food to all the first responders, like does all this actual charitable work. Not like, I'm not talking about the Vatican. I'm talking about the church in my neighborhood did right. actual good stuff. Uh, and it's hard to look at that and go, well, there's no good in that. Like, well, no, actually there's a tremendous amount of community building support, the, the emotional and mental well being of being in a group of people that are doing good for other people just to do good is a powerful thing. Right. Well, and that's going to be really hard to, uh, uh, to sustain without God. But, but it, I mean, I'm not saying it can't be done. I mean, it yeah, has yeah. to be done. Yeah. But it is not going to be easy. Now, Tom Crotmaker, who writes for USA Today, um, his way of doing this work is to say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I'm secular. And I believe in the teachings of Jesus. And, you know, that works too. Sure. There are a lot of things that work. The major thing is to uh, is to understand that we we have a lack now and we need something that works. Yeah. So yeah. my 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 um, criticism of the new atheists is simply they they thought this was sort of automatic. Yeah. As soon as people didn't believe in God anymore, everything would be fine. And that and they had never read Chesterton, who said when a man stops believing in God, he doesn't believe in nothing. He believes in anything. Well, and again, sort of as a side note, like I worked at Wired back in the in 99, 2000, like in the transition from uh, the sort of manufacturing world into this digital world. And a bunch of writers like me said, oh, my God, this is going to democratize the world. Everybody mm -hmm. will now have a voice. And we didn't realize everybody now has a voice. And this is like without any controls over that. And so you both see this flourishing freedom, but also Nazis come back. Like the smallpox, right. like we thought that was gone and then they showed up again and we thought, oh, like, so there is this, I think, I don't know if it's a human, like we believe in the best things will just happen and forget that you actually have to be vigilant about these things. Yeah. And, and you know, to a certain extent, it's good to, to expect good things to happen. You know, I mean, Dr. King in, in that quote, he thought good things would happen too, but of course, Nobody could accuse Dr. King of being passive. Right, right. And that's that's what I mean, like living with a purpose and being purposeful in what you do and not just assuming that we're all headed down the same path in the same way because we're not. And it's it, did this, did your crisis of faith come out of the work that you did? Because you spent a lot of time, you spent many years with death penalty, like with really hard, emotional, ethical real life stakes things with the law like is is that a growth like is that how that happened no no quite the opposite in fact it was a real embarrassment in my synagogue my anti-death penalty uh, work caused me to become pro-life and i was like the only pro-life person in a liberal synagogue you can imagine yeah that, you know, that was a, that was I, I remember i was represent one day i was representing um 
at a project at school, I was representing the uh, uh, pro-life demonstrators in Operation Rescue, the first wave in the 80s. And at the same time, I, I had a death penalty case about a man who had killed and uh, uh, he had abused his daughter and he killed her. And my mother called me up and she said, I don't understand how you can do that kind of representation. And I said, well, mom, every, it's a death penalty case. Everybody deserves representation. She said, no, not him, those pro-life demonstrators. <laughs> So, you know, it, it was an embarrassment, but no, I'm afraid that my um, lack of faith in God came out of two things. Number one, science. All these people who say science is compatible with religion, it's not compatible with the religion I grew up in, because the religion I grew up in had a creator God who could do tricks with the universe, and even the wind and the, and the water obeyed him, and that's just not true. I mean, it, as far as I could see, that wasn't true. Yeah. And my synagogues, none of the synagogues, none of the churches, Islam, it doesn't really matter in the West anyway. Um, none of them gave me any other kind of religion other than that. And I, I, so I, I was getting mad every week in synagogue at what people would say about God. And finally, my friend and teacher, Robert Taylor, at school said to me, your attitude in, in services is the least religious attitude I've ever seen stop going. It's bad for you. It's bad for the synagogue. It's bad for everybody. And he was right. And so I no longer identify as Jewish. That had to be really difficult. No. Jews don't do that. Yes, that had to be really, really difficult. Yeah. I mean, the, the fairness, the Christians don't either. Like, it's not like you lose, you lose some things when you go. Identity, culture. Oh, yeah. You know, community. So it's hard. But, but, but what was interesting to me is uh, I, I still have a very good relationship with Dor Hadash. I still pay. In fact, I still make a contribution every year in the, what, what the dues would be because I'm so grateful to yeah. Dor Hadash for being such a great synagogue. But I, they invited me back to talk about my journey. And I explained that I no longer believed in God and had to, had to leave Judaism. And afterwards, a, a few of my friends came up and said, well, why'd you have to leave? I don't believe in God. So, the, you know, it was just like, huh? What does that have to do with it? And yet a few years later, I ran into an, uh, one of these uh, Orthodox Jewish men who go around finding Jews who are fallen away and try to get them to do something to try to bring them back. There, th this happens um, all, all over the place, as a matter of fact. So anyway, I ran into, I ran into uh, this person in uh, the um, uh, Children's Museum. And he said, are you Jewish? And I said, I used to be. And he said, I've never heard that answer before. What happened? And I told him, and he understood, because for him, religion was a living relationship with God. And if that went, then he could understand disaffection. Yeah. It, the thing that my father told me a long time ago, which I think maybe you and I have gone through the same sort of issue, is that everywhere you go, all through human history, all over the world, I've traveled all over the place, there are people, have, and it doesn't matter you know, pre-internet, all that stuff, people have a predisposition to look for meaning in the universe. Yes. And, and they construct those meanings. All of us construct those meanings. And my dad always said there has to be something to that human desire. Like well, that's always been his. And, and this, the, in, in the book, in, in my book, The Universe is on Our Side, I, I really do um, not argue against the no, in answer to that question, but I argue the yes. I mean, I, I, I set forth the no, don't argue with it, but I also set forth the yes, that's my position. But you know, the one problem with saying the universe is nothing but forces and matter, and we're an accident, is it means that that longing that you've just described is not part of the universe, it's an accident. Right. And that's very hard to understand. Why in evolutionary theory should there be such a thing as an accident? Do you have an answer to that? No, I don't think it is an accident. I think it, it testifies to the fact that, you know, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, there have been a number of scientists, uh, philosophers, scientists in process philosophy and process theology who have said um, materialism does not, is not good for science. It's really not a scientific uh, viewpoint. And that um, there, are, there, are, um, uh, uh, there are a sense of normative values in the universe. Um, that are perfectly reasonable, scientific, objective, and this longing for meaning is one of them. 
you know, uh, if evolution points in that direction, then maybe it's consonant with the sort of thing the universe actually is. I mean, you, I think if, if I'm hanging on what you're saying here is like, there is a need for collective action as people, right? Like we are not meant to be like that to me is that is what that meaning longing is, is when you're always looking for, or at least I am always looking for the tribe, the group, the people, the collection. I think that's why religion is so powerful to people because it is that it not, it doesn't provide identity, although identity is part of that, but it, it provides a feeling of safety and belonging Right. That I and think it, is an innate, I think that's a part of this humanness. Yeah, I think you're right. And, but it doesn't have to be tribal. I mean, that's our problem. Our problem is that when, when God is dead and, it, and this affects religion too. Yeah. So when God is dead, all, all you have are the forms of religion and that's where you get, you know, the, the orthodoxy. That's where yeah, you yeah, get yeah. fundamentalism. Yeah. Um, at that point, it becomes tribal. But I meant it, tribal in a in a broader sense in that you are just always looking for a community. Of no, no, I, I understand. And it could be healthy. Yeah. Because, because it can be universal. You can yes. say, we we reflect the universal longing. We reflect yes. yeah, a universal truth. Yes. And at its best, that's what religion does. Yeah. But at its worst, <laughs> does the other thing. us versus them. Yeah. Well, in George, Car you know, I had to, this show started with me interviewing George Carlin many, many years ago. And he didn't George, say it on really? the show. Yeah. But he oh. said it elsewhere, which was. I trust people. I don't trust them when they get in groups of three or more, you know, like, <laughs> like that's when things, as soon as two can be against one, that's when shit goes wrong because that tribal, the sort of worst part of the tribal nature comes out, right? Which is there is a me and there is a you. And we see humans do that in every possible gender, race, identity, religion, like anytime we can parse the, the pie, we parse we the pie. Which is why the myth of God was so beneficial. Because God was the was the parent of everyone. Yeah. You know, and, and the universe is that too. You know, you can get that from quite naturally without supernaturalism. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. And, and I want to wrap this up um, because we could talk about this forever. Because this, I think, is the sort of fundamental nature of what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be a good human in this world? Um, do you think... Because my girlfriend and I talk about this all the time. Like, do you think that we can exist in a world where religion provides some of these things for people in a good way? And that these the secular folks like me and you are trying to sort of build this goodness as well. Can those things exist together if we as we move forward in our society? Or have yes. we reached a point where it's gonna have to be one or the other? No, I don't think so. Um, now it, it depends, it depends on the answer to the question, is the universe on our side? Yeah. If the answer is no, then there's the potential for conflict with religion, because religion's answer, of course, is yes. But if secularism's answer becomes yes, or yes, but, or, you know, some yeah. form of yes, yeah. that can be very close to religion, and no longer are you fighting. Yeah. Because from the perspective of a religious person, someone like me in this book is actually very close to God, but doesn't know it. I've heard this already. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. Because, you know, that is a common ground. So I think if the universe is, is, is a place of harmony and potential coming together, then religion and sec and the secular also come together. Yeah. And you know, this is the, I mean, I agree with that sentiment because my girlfriend and I have this discussion all the time. And she's told people when they've asked, like, what is it like dating an atheist? And she's like, he's a good per like, He's a good person. He's trying to do the work to do good things. Like that is what Christians do. Like he's doing right. the stuff that we do. Like, and I don't walk into a church and look around and like, I don't pull like a, a Dawkins or any of those folks were like, well, this is dumb. Like, well, I know and, if I'm and in your house, I'm in your house. Right. And, and that's why I didn't like it when Sam Harris named his famous book, the end of faith. Yeah. He, he didn't understand that you couldn't have any truth without faith of some kind. Yeah. And Hitchens, you know, like I loved Hitchens and he was a fantastic was a, writer. Was a but great like, guy. Yeah. Yeah. But was, you know, <laughs> if, if anybody's read Hitchens, I don't need to explain it. Like he was, not, he was very dogmatic in his dogma and there wasn't room for other people. Like he was uh, there to eviscerate the competition and not to find a common ground 
with people that disagree. That's right. And so, and that's what Shermer, uh, the, the uh, founder of Skeptic Magazine, said to me in a, in a, in a different podcast. He said, um, you have to be skeptical even about skepticism. Yeah. You, you, know, you have to keep open and keeping open is really the important thing. And I think that's the most liberal, and I don't mean this politically, but that's the, I always tell people like the, the little parable I use, I had two grandmothers, like many people. Uh, I had one that was a country grandma and her house was lived in. I mean, when she died, we had to bring dump trucks to get everything out. And I had another grandmother who kept all of her furniture in plastic. And when you went over there, you like, that was in, right. and one life gets very small, the older you get, and one life gets very big. And that to me is the sort of liberalism that you're talking about, which is if, if I live in it and if I know it's never going to be perfect, and then I know that there's going to be lots of people in it, your world's going to be very big and it's going to be better. Yeah. And if you do right. this other thing where you say it needs to stay this way forever. I was very lucky to have both grandmothers. I love them both. And they also presented me with this worldview without right. knowing you, it. They gave you a story to tell. Yeah. And so when I hear, like, when I read things like this, I'm just so appreciative of you because while I love, you know, I've met Dawkins and I come from the science and technology world and, and I love the new atheists. I also love my family who are very religious and I came mm -hmm. out of the church and I see lots of Venn diagram and overlap that we just aren't able to talk about anymore. Right. And there, it, that's absolutely right. And that's part of our partisan, now, now partisan. Originally, this was a division that was theological. Now it's become partisan. Yeah. And it's funny when it was theological, it was e more easily breached than it is now that it's political, which yeah. is a lesser category. Yeah. And it's also funny that I think the right, you know, sort of derides the leftist identity politics. And I'm like, I mean, the religious right is identity politics. Like the oh, reason yeah. it's so hard to talk about this is everybody has internalized their identity as one of these two things and refuse to see that those identities may not be as far away as you think. Right. And, and I hope, I, I don't know this, but I think it's true that this is the first book in a long time about the breakdown of American public life that both sides of the aisle can read. Yeah, well, I hope so. I, I mean, I it's, think it, that it's true. It's I the only way through. Yeah, it's the only way through. Uh, so the universe is on our side, restoring faith in American public life. It's When's it coming out? Is it out it's now? Out. It's just what? out. Oh, man. So that's exciting. Yes, it's very exciting. It is. And also probably a little bit... Uh, nerve-wracking considering the time of year i mean hopefully people will take this for what it is but also you never know how a, a book like this will land in this culture well it's true um now i've got january 20 here uh, the pittsburgh uh, arts and lectures is having a program 6 p.m i get to do a book talk oh great uh, and so uh, if people are interested in the and they're around pittsburgh or online if they have it too but in person uh you can uh, come uh, contact pittsburgh arts and lectures and um you could get a ticket and come. It's free. I will. Absolutely. I'm going to do that because I'm here and we should meet because uh, we're in the same city, like 10 minutes from each other. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, Bruce, uh, you are just it's so it's so great to talk to you. I love people that are tackling big issues because we, I feel like we've shied away from that in life because of not not the polarization, but just people are afraid to have these conversations. And what a gift for you to write this book and to and to wade into what I think is one of the most important issues that we're dealing with in the country. Well, thank you, Brad. That's very kind of you to say. Uh, you have a great holiday season. I hope that we get to meet soon and I hope we can do this again soon. Good. No, no problem. I'd be very happy to. Thank you again for having me. Well, there you have it. That was Bruce Ledowitz, whose book, The Universe is on Our Side, Restoring Faith in American Public Life, which is out right now. Uh, what a fantastic conversation. And I did not, I forgot he was here in Pittsburgh until we just started talking. And it's always nice to talk to a neighbor. Before we get out of here, just a couple of reminders. If you like what you heard today, and it was a fantastic conversation, so I don't know how you wouldn't like it. Do us those two favors we talked about at the top of the show. Tell a friend about us leave us a review either at apple Podcasts or over at the facebook page don't forget to check out all the other shows on the solid listen podcast network malls and nicole are doing a great job building everything out uh, and that includes the flagship program mother may i sleep with podcast with host and our solid listen podcast queen molly mclear 
The video podcasts come out on Mondays and Fridays. You can always find those on the Solid Listen Network YouTube channel. You can also find them at theridersjam.com, or you can check out the audio wherever you listen to the Downtown Riders Jam. And the jam comes out every Wednesday. The surest way to not miss anything we do here, get subscribed. And remember, you can always catch us on Twitter and Instagram at The Writers Jam. Until the next time, we'll see you around the internet. <laughs> <laughs>